from a primary care kind of preventive medicine background before I got into a super technical field. And I'm really lucky enough to have been in surgery for long enough for the whole field to change completely. So to, from going to big open surgeries and operating on everything to now doing minimally invasive surgeries and using a robot and trying not to operate very much on people because we have so many technologies and techniques now that allow us to understand what's going on with patients better and to minimize their downtime and then enhance their recoveries. And some, if Tiffany wants me to talk about enhanced recovery pathways at some point, or if we have extra time tonight, I can do that because that's been a game changer. Um, I, about 50% of my practice is general surgery. So it's gonna be gallbladders and hernias and things like that. And about 50% is, col is colon and rectal surgery. And um, that includes um, taking care of benign and malignant conditions of the colon and rectum and the anus. Nobody likes to use the word anus. Um, and so that means colon cancer, diverticulitis, um, colonic inertia, which are motility problems like chronic constipation, um, as well as hemorrhoids, fissures, fistulas, anal cancers. Um, and then I do some, you know, I do breast surgery also. That's where Tiffany and I work together mostly. Um, so, yeah. and, and I've spent the last several years um, in leadership at St. John's also. So I got to, I had the privilege of being chief of staff um, for two years and now I'm chief of surgery. So I'm really lucky that my career has just kept changing and being exciting. It is. And, uh, and, you know, you have a lot of areas of expertise and your patients are obviously very, um, lucky to to have you and i think the point that you made about a lot of the progress that we've made as much as we love to operate no one wants to have a surgery so um, we are really excited about things like um, prevention or, or things that help keep people out of the operating room and a lot of times you and i meet someone because they need a surgery um, but there's a lot of other aspects of their of their health that we want to pay attention to so that to minimize that in the future so you know, I think there's a couple of great um, topics to, to go through today, and maybe we'll start with um, diverticulitis. And you guys, if you have questions, please put them in the um, in the chat box or other topics that you that you want to discuss. But you know, I think most people don't really know what diverticulitis is, which is something that can that can be managed medically or surgically. But most people who've had a colonoscopy know if they had a diverticula or not. And then that can lead to either getting a colonoscopy and again in 10 years or five years. And um, so can you talk a little bit about what that is so that, you know, as people hear their, their GI surgeon or whoever gave them their colonoscopy, you know, say what they have, how that impacts their health and what they can do to, um, to avoid that. You bet. Okay, so diverticulitis, well, let's start with diverticula. The, the definition of the word diverticula is like a little outpouching or a little pocket, if you will. Um, and so they can occur, they occur on the colon, they can occur in the small bowel, they can occur in the stomach, they can occur anywhere, but most commonly they're in the colon and most commonly they're in the left side of the colon. And I can explain why that is, but it has to do with the pressure in the colon, um, the differential pressures in the colon. And 50% of people over the age of 50 have diverticula. So having the condition of diverticula is known as diverticulosis, okay? And so you may see on your colonoscopy report that you have diverticulosis, and that's not diverticulitis, which is um, an inflammation of the diverticulum on the colon. We're talking about colon now. So diverticulitis is an inflammation of the diverticulum. The way that you know you have a complication associated with your condition of diverticulosis is that you'll, excuse me, you'll either have, you can have bleeding or infection. Diverticular bleeding is painless bleeding. It's usually bright red, depending on which side the of the colon it's on, but it's usually bright red blood. It's painless bleeding. 
and it's usually self-limited in stock, not to be confused with hemorrhoid bleeding. Um, more commonly, the complication that occurs with diverticulosis is pain. Um, and we treat it as if it's an infection, but it actually usually isn't an infection. That can go on to perforation. And so it's like if you blow out a little bleb in a tire, um, it's not like it explodes, but if, if the wall, the integrity of the wall of the colon gets compromised by this perforation in the diverticulum, then you can, can, you can have some either localized contamination with poop um, or bacteria, or if you're unlucky, it's a bigger blowout and you can have significant contamination that leads to a significant infection in the belly. So how do you know if you have diverticulitis? Um, usually it's localized pain and tenderness in the left lower quadrant. So on the left side of the belly above your hip bone and associated with fever. Sometimes people can get irritation. They, it, it irritates the bladder because the colon sits right next to the bladder there. And so if they get an inf infection in the colon, that kind of um, where the bladder approximates it, then they can also get irritation of the bladder so they can get bladder symptoms also. Most of the time, people with diverticulosis who have pain in the left lower quadrant don't have infection. So then you're gonna say, well, how do I know what, what, when to go to the doctor? So if you have persistent pain in the left lower quadrant, um, symptoms that it's, they're urinary symptoms, but it's kind of like when you pee at the end of peeing, it really hurts, um, or fever, then you need to go to the doctor. If you have intermittent pain on the left side, which comes and goes and feels better after you poop, that's probably not diverticulitis. We used to, so we do treat, and when people have diverticulitis, how do we confirm that it's that? Usually it's a CT scan that shows some inflammation, swelling um, around that area of the colon. And the norm is to treat that with antibiotics. If you're able to keep down food and you're not systemically very sick, you're usually treated with an antibiotic that covers a couple different types of bacteria. And if your symptoms go away within seven to 10 days, you're over it and that's great. The likelihood that you'll have another episode of diverticulitis in your lifetime is pretty big. Can you keep treating those intermittently with antibiotics? Absolutely. And um, there's a lot of literature that shows that when people who have known diverticular disease get recurrent pain, that we actually shouldn't be treating that with antibiotics. The only thing we should be treating with antibiotics are signs of sepsis or infection. That being said, people get a little pain in the left lower quadrant and they end up getting antibiotics. When do you need surgery for diverticulitis? So there's some people who are very easily controlled on antibiotics and that's great. Other people require hospitalization either because they get, you know, they have other systemic symptoms, fever, um, terrible pain that's not controllable with uh, and with uh, over-the-counter medications, they get obstruct, they can get obstruction, they can't poop, or if you get a bad enough infection, what the way the body takes care of infection in the belly is it recruits everything around it to wall it off. So that can be the small bowel. And if you get a bowel obstruction from that, then you, if it doesn't get better by itself, you're gonna need surgery. What surgery do we do? And everybody, when you talk about colon surgery, the first thing they say is, I'd rather die than have a bag. And that's a, not a surprising response. And the best way to deal with that is, you know, most people aren't ever gonna come to having a bag. So the operation is to take out that segment of the colon that's affected by the diverticulitis. And when I started surgery, we did that by making a big old incision and the patients were in the hospital for six to 10 days. They didn't get anything to eat for the first six days and they couldn't even get out of bed. And 
We've whipped that right around to minimally invasive surgery. So we do it through small incisions using um, advanced laparoscopic techniques. And I actually use robotic assisted laparoscopic surgery. So it allows me to do all of that through um, five tiny little incisions and then a two inch incision to take out the specimen. And we feed patients right away and they don't need any narcotic pain medicine and they go home in a couple of days and they're back to about 85% in two weeks. So it's kind of a different story. It is, so that's I just a, an amazing, um, amazing no, it's, progress, it's, right? It's, so since yes. most people, since we don't, <laughs> that's Maggie. Sorry about my dog. <laughs> so um, since we obviously want to avoid getting to that surgery part, when people have the osis part, right, which is the non-fever part, is their primary care doctor able to take care of this? And when do they see a specialist and who is that specialist? So if you have the osis part, you don't need to do anything. Um, there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing to do until you develop a complication from diverticulitis, um, from diverticular disease, sorry. You can, like I said, 50% of people over the age of 50 have diverticulum and it just doesn't matter. So you don't have to do anything. The reason that we see so much diverticulosis in our population, they think has to do with the low fiber diet that we eat. Um, interestingly enough, when we're treating diverticulitis, we put people on a low fiber diet, <laughs> but in general, a high fiber diet is better I told you that the pockets form because of different differences in pressures in that segment of the colon. <clears throat> and so if you're, if you have constipation and you're straining and, you know, you, you have a tendency to develop these things. So, you know, the best recommendation is to just eat a high fiber diet, drink plenty of liquids, get lots of exercise and poop. Pooping's what are the food. fibers? Like what's, what's your high fiber in your diet? Oh, uh, well, I'm a big, I don't do fiber supplements. I just drink, I don't drink enough water, but I eat lots of vegetables and fresh fruits and nuts and grains and seeds. It's amazing when people tell me, oh, I eat salad every day. I'm eating a high fiber diet. Salad has about zero fiber in it. But um, the best high fiber foods are prunes and berries with seeds like raspberries and boysenberries. Interesting. Um, uh, whole grains. Um, and so those are some high fiber foods that you can eat. Um, raw is better than cooked. Um, so, and then in terms of fiber supplementation, um, there are two types of fiber, insoluble and soluble fiber. Soluble fiber is great for your cholesterol, doesn't do much for bulking your stools. So insoluble fiber is better. And there's um, any, any psyllium based product is okay. great. So you can get over the counter generic psyllium, mix it in your smoothie. Um, and there you go. So that's diverticular disease. Where does the, um, the diverticula come into play with the colonoscopy? I know, you know, you hear people like, if you don't have any, you don't need a colonoscopy for 10 years. If you have some, you need one in five years or why, why is that? And how does that, so it's Tax not, um, so diverticul di diverticula, diverticula, the plural of diverticulum, diverticula actually don't impact how often you get a colonoscopy. So I think what you're thinking of is polyps. And it's, so it's, and we can talk about colon cancer and polyps for a few minutes also, but um, you can have diverticula and then not get another colonoscopy if you have no polyps. Um, or if you're not high risk for another 10 years and probably so that's nothing's just changed. the risk of diverticulitis, not of any cancer. Right. And the, and the percentage of people who develop diverticulitis out of those who have diverticulosis is very small. And the Excellent. percentage of people who need surgery for diverticulitis is infinitesimally small. So the indications for surgery are um, quality of life, um, meaning that if you get an attack of diverticulitis that takes you out every couple of months or once a year even, or you travel remotely and you've had them frequently and you don't wanna get sick somewhere else, 
God, I hope we're traveling remotely someday again. Um, <laughs> those are considerations. Absolute indications are if you have a bowel obstruction or something called a fistula between the colon and the bladder or the colon and the vagina. And you can only have that if you've had a hysterectomy. And that's when I said you get an infection and the body walls it off. And then the, the abscess, which is the pus collection, can perforate through whatever's walling it off into the adjacent area. And so um, that's the only indication, absolute indication um, for surgery besides peritonitis, which is where you have a belly full of poop and God, I hope you never have that. We hope we never have that. So we since hope you we're talking never about that. pooping, um, and, Yay, pooping and fiber, so there's obviously a range of normal. How does, how does that fiber and your bowel movements affect hemorrhoids? And let's like move into that because that's something that nobody wants to talk about, but everybody but should me. know a little bit about them, <laughs> except for you. I actually give a talk called Everything Down There is Not a Hemorrhoid because, <laughs> because it's not. Um, so you bring up two things. One is, you know, this concept of what is a nor what are normal bowel habits and how do abnormal bowel habits affect what's going on down there. So it's really funny. People will come in and say, you know, well, I have diarrhea. I have a bowel movement every two, twice every day. Okay. Well, that's not diarrhea. That's just you, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, I don't know if y'all are, are familiar with the Bristol stool scale and that's the little six square scale that shows anything from nice big logs to little tiny rabbit turds. And you're supposed to rate your stools and I think you're supposed to aim for something. I'm not sure what it is, but the big, the big take home message is whatever's, whatever's normal for you is normal for you. And as long as your bowel habits aren't interrupting your quality of life, you're good. Some people go twice a day and some people go every two days. Um, some people who eat a lot of fiber poop every time that they pee, you know, and that's normal for them and it doesn't interrupt their life. And other people, um, unfortunately, I have met a number of people who poop like every seven days only and feel miserable in between and have to take medicine to poop. And that's not normal, but pretty much everything else is in between. Um, and so the other rule I have, and I tell my patients, I was trying to think of how to say this is the less time you send, spend sitting on the toilet, the better off you are for about a zillion reasons. But you know, people hide in the bathroom, they sit and play words with friends or smoke their cigarettes <laughs> or answer their email or whatever it is. And the longer that your butt is hanging into this empty hole with no, no, nothing supporting it, the more the blood is gonna flow down there and all sorts of things can happen. So I always tell people, go and get up. And if you can't go, get up and come back later. And it, it's amazing when they get permission not to have to sit there and have a bowel movement, how relieved they are, you know? And, but, but I, you know, I feel like I have to go more, but I can't go, okay, get up and come back when you have to go. So what can happen? What are the common benign anorectal complaints? Um, the most common, everybody thinks they have hemorrhoids. Anything down there is a hemorrhoid. I have itching, it's a hemorrhoid. I have bleeding, it's a hemorrhoid. I have swelling, it's a hemorrhoid. I have nothing down there, but I know I have hemorrhoids. Um, and what hemorrhoids are, are they're normal parts of the anatomy. Everyone has hemorrhoids. Everybody has hemorrhoids. Whether your hemorrhoids bother you or not, are another story. So the anal canal is actually that part of the butthole that goes from the outside or the butt cheeks to the inside about four centimeters up inside and that's all covered by skin so and then up above that is the rectum and that's covered by um, mucosa which lines the intestines and that's important for can from cancer standpoints but the veins and arteries that supply and drain the anus and the distal rectum are called hemorrhoidal veins and arteries. And they start up in the rectum and they end down at the bottom. 
Most women who have babies have had experience at have vaginal deliveries or attempted vaginal deliveries have a little experience with hemorrhoids because when you're pushing and pushing and pushing, you get swelling down there. Those are external hemorrhoids generally. So the external hemorrhoids are the ones that swell. They can itch. They can get a blood clot in them, which isn't dangerous, but hurts like hell. And um, there, it's all bothersome, but not dangerous. Um, and then the internal hemorrhoids are the ones that can pooch out, but then go back up inside, or you have to push them back up inside and those bleed. The way you take care of hemorrhoids, if they're really an issue is internal hemorrhoids generally can be rubber banded in the office. Um, and what the rubber band does is it, I, I just deploy some rubber bands on the hemorrhoid and just sort of chokes it off. And after five to seven days, it just sloughs and goes away. That will often take care of areas that either are bleeding or kind of pooch out. Injection, there are, we have another, um, up in the Cedars area, there's, they have a different culture with hemorrhoids and it's um, sort of an annuity plan that they have there where they bring their patients in every month and they inject their hemorrhoids, whether you need it or not. My feeling is anything that you have to do every month for years at a time is obviously not working and let's move on. So I actually don't inject hemorrhoids at all. I just band them or suggest something else or you just leave them alone. Um, external hemorrhoids, unfortunately, um, the only treatment you can do for those is surgery where you cut them off. And that is miserable surgery. Um, the reason people, if they have significant, if you have big hemorrhoids, um, you can have hygiene problems. And so people complain of residual stool and wiping forever and they get irritated and, you know, they are miserable. And I, I tell people, you have to tell me when it's time to go. I'm not going to tell you. I've had a handful of people bleed to the point of anemia who have, I have said it's time for your hemorrhoid surgery. But other than that, it is, you know, you have to make sure that you understand that the cure is worse than the disease. Um, it's pretty funny. Everything down there feels like it's the size of your head, you know, and people come in and say, oh, I have this huge thing down there and I can't stand it. And I look, I'm like, what? I don't see anything. It's normal. That's normal. Yeah, that's normal. Um, fissures are horrible. I can figure those out from what you tell me. I have pain and bleeding when I have a bowel movement makes me cry when I think about having to go, but it only lasts a few seconds. Um, that's an anal fissure, and that is like a little ulcer in the anal canal, and you can get that from having diarrhea or from having constipation. Most of the time, they go away by themselves. If they don't, um, you can. there's a little hard lump that people feel. That's called a sentinel tag. And the greatest thing about that is that if it doesn't go away with the medicine that I give you, which about 50% of the time chronic anal fissures will go away with medicine, there's a very small operation that can be done um, called a partial internal sphincterotomy. And it's the one operation that I do where people say, oh my God, I wish I had done that so sooner. Everybody's afraid to come in and talk about how bad their ass hurts, first of all. Then secondly, once they do come in, they're afraid to do anything about it. And then once they do it, it's like, I have a new life because who wants to worry about going to the bathroom every day? Um, so what are the things that someone should come in for? Is it bleeding and something on the outside or they should just see their primary care doctor or they should I see a gastroenterologist? Yeah, yeah, I would prefer that people went and saw their primary care doctor or their gastroenterologist before they come in to see me because a lot of times your regular doctor especially people in Santa Monica, because I've trained them well, know how to deal with a lot of this stuff. Um, so I don't need to, I'm a surgeon, right? So I don't need to see every itchy rear end in Santa Monica because there's a great medicine out there. It's over the counter. It's called Comoceptine. It's awesome. Um, and it works. And so most of the primary care docs and GI docs about know about that now. When you should, you you should see somebody if you have persistent bleeding or spontaneous bleeding that doesn't, isn't associated with bowel movements or pain that is interrupting your life um, or 
um, a, a lesion or a skin patch or something that doesn't go away. Um, is persistent bleeding how many days? Well, persistent bleeding is not once, you know, one or two days every couple of months. It's, you know, I, I don't, that's a good question. I don't have a definition for that, but it's, yeah. it's sort of daily bleeding. Um, okay. But it's also more spontaneous bleeding. You know, that's not associated with a bowel movement. Um, I have two other questions when you're done with this thought. Yeah, I mean, I guess my take home message here is if there is something that's bothering you, you should see somebody see somebody and not be embarrassed. And if, if you have a complaint in your bottom and that doctor doesn't stick their finger, you know, do a digital rectal exam, which is putting their finger up your bottom, that's that you need to go find another doctor. Um, and I can't tell you, I mean, I really, it breaks my heart to think of how many patients over the years I've diagnosed with rectal cancer that's locally advanced or that's been um, uh, ig not ignored, but be a delayed diagnosis basically because somebody's been treating them over the phone or without examining them for hemorrhoids for years. Anal cancer is the same way. So it's totally preventable by getting your exam. colonoscopy or an anal exam. Yeah, go ahead and ask that. Question. Okay, so first, let me do this one quickly. How do you spell that over-the-counter medication? Oh, it's awesome. It's called Calmoseptine, C-A-L-M-O-S-E-P-T-I-N-E. -E. Okay, I always put it in the people, chat box. Yeah, put it in the chat box. And um, yeah, you get two tubes of it. Keep one at your bedside and one in your backpack or purse. And stop scratching and just put this on and count to 10 and it's God's gift to itchy asses. The, um, the other one is uh, something about a THD Doppler hemorrhoid. System. Yeah. Okay. So about THD, that? I call, I think, I think THD is like super rubber banding. So THD is meant for it's transanal hemorrhoidal dearterialization, and it is meant for internal hemorrhoids only. So if there's no if there's no significant external component, it's okay. And I use it for circumferential hemorrhoids. So people who don't have like one hemorrhoid, but if you if you're somebody who has prolapsing bleeding hemorrhoids in multiple quadrants inside the anal rectum, and you're going to be coming to me, you know, every three weeks for banding for a, you know, for months forget it. Let's just go to the operating room. And what the, what it is, is there's a scope that goes inside that has a Doppler that allows a Doppler signal. Now a Doppler signal is um, something that's audible where we can hear the arterial pulses. So you hear a shoo, 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 shoo. And when I find that, and there are six hemorrhoidal arteries that I'm looking for, when I find that, this, the THD is actually built with a very specific needle driver. It shows me exactly where I need to find that artery so I can put a stitch around it and basically block off that artery so it doesn't supply the hemorrhoid anymore and the hemorrhoids just shrink and go away. Part of that procedure though is something called a mucosal proctoplasty. And it's where you actually, if you have hemorrhoids that are coming down, you basically can catch those internal hemorrhoids and pleat them back up inside. So you bring them way up inside so they don't fall out anymore. So THD has a real role. And I used to do stapled hemorrhoidectomy for this on um, that, that problem, but I like THD a lot. And here's the other thing about THD. They advertise it as painless hemorrhoidectomy. No, 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 no. Nothing that happens down there is painless. So. <laughs> Okay, um, and then there was a question about, do you know if calmoseptine has steroids in it? No, it doesn't. So that's the great thing. So calmoseptine is calamine, um, zinc oxide, and menthol. And it's awesome. Oh. Yeah, and it's, it's, like di it's like, you know, diaper cream. Um, it is, it's one of those things where if you, if you just have itching, it's, it's great. And you put it on, you say nothing's happening, and then you, 10 seconds later, you're like, ah. Oh. 
Um, <laughs> but if, if you have something open or a dermatitis around the bottom, some, and you put a little bit on, some, te- some people find it irritating, but most people find it very soothing and it's thick and it's thick and messy, but it is also a skin protectant. So um, if you develop perianal, it's, you know, itchy, but it's called paritis ani in Latin. And, um, and it's usually due to a perianal dermatitis, which means a, like a, a skin inflammation that you get. So sometimes the first thing you have to do is stop using baby wipes. Because if you're using wipes and you're not drying off or there's something in the wipes that you're allergic to, it's miserable. Um, and then... Um, so stop using baby wipes. And then you have to look at if you've changed anything, new soap, new lotion, new toilet paper, new pads, new whatever. Um, you, then you pull off of that. And then there's certain foods that are associated with perianal dermatitis and itchy butts. If you've been eating these your whole life, that's probably not the problem. But if you've just started eating, like in the summer, tomatoes. And all of a sudden your butt's itching. It might be the tomatoes. So it's tomatoes, nuts, um, chocolate, cola, coffee, caffeinated tea, beer, and wine. And so what I tell people is take all these foods. If you say, oh, I eat all that stuff every day. Okay, take all these foods and stop eating them or stop one at a time. But I usually say stop eating all this stuff give it a couple weeks. If you're better, add them back one at a time. Like if somebody told me I had to stop eating chocolate, I'd probably live with my itchy butt forever, but, or buy stock in camoceptine. But um, <laughs> so there's, there are, there's ways to take care of all of this stuff. That's great. So let's, um, let's shift a little bit to um, colon cancer and more specifically um, colonoscopy. Sorry. Um, I know <laughs> Maggie just wants attention. Um, no, she's, I don't know, there's a dog outside. Can you be quiet? Please. So you and I were talking earlier and you were saying that the, um, the age to start oh, yeah. colonoscopy is, is younger than 50. And then can you also talk about the difference between doing a colonoscopy, a virtual Absolutely. colonoscopy, and a smear or a cologuard so that right. we know kind of like, what should we be asking for? Okay, so it used to be that 50 was the age to start screening. Um, in the average risk person, um, and I'm sorry, Max, come here. Come here. Okay, it's part of Zoom life. Now. I know this Cat, is very dog, professional. Kid. I know your dog's not supposed to bark. Um, so 50 used to be the age of, of if you're an average risk person to start screening. Well, we've dropped that down to 45. Um, that's actually even more important in um, in patients who are at higher risk. And so if you have a primary family member who has a history of colon cancer, so that is mother, father, sibling, or child, you need to up your screening. Forget about the child part. So the mother, father, sibling, you need to start 10 years, 10 years earlier than the onset of their or their diagnosis when they were first diagnosed. So say your, your mom had colon cancer at 55, you'll start at 45, okay? It used to be starting at 50. And then it it used to be that we did colonoscopy on a much more frequent basis, but population studies show that if you have a negative colonoscopy and you're you're of average risk, you you don't need another colonoscopy for 10 years. And I'll tell you why that is. All colon cancers start from changes in the lining of the colon or rectum. And they develop polyps and a polyp is a growth. And those polyps can either look like a mushroom and so they're on a stalk and grow out or they can be flat polyps, kind of like uh, pile carpeting, okay? And so we know that for most average colon cancers, not genetically driven colon cancers, that the time from the polyp to cancer sequence takes about 10 years. So what causes a polyp or a cancer? It's a mutation. It's an unlucky change in one of the genes in in the cells that line the intestine that allows for uncontrolled cell division. So 
it has to go from one cell to two to four to eight to 16, 32, 64, and then on and on and on. And that all takes time. Depending on the mutation and the cell cycle, that could take days between each cell division, weeks, months. So you can go from having nothing there um, to having something, something that's visible, but it could take years. Um, there's so much to talk about with respect to colon cancer. Um, and so let's just go, let's divide this up and let's talk about screening. So who needs to be screened? People at average risk starting at age 45, people at higher risk starting earlier. Who's at higher risk? Those people who have a family history, uh, in primary family history, those people with inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, those people who have a family history of some other genetic syndrome like um, Lynch syndrome or which is called HNPCC, which is hereditary non-polyposis, colon cancer syndrome, um, and some other, some other genetic syndromes, family cancer syndromes. Um, diverticulitis does not put you at risk for colon cancer. Constipation does not put you at risk for colon cancer. And so how do we screen for colon cancer? Used to be that fecal occult blood testing, I mean, um, occult uh, fecal stool testing is what I'm trying to say, which Tiffany affectionately calls the poop smear, um, <laughs> which is where your doctor used to send you home with these little things and you had to dig the poop out of the deal and, and um, smear it on the thing. And then they'd send it in and put a little dye on it and see if there's blood on it. But we don't do that anymore. So if your doctor's doing that for you and telling you that's okay. That's not okay. Um, the most common thing is colonoscopy. The reason that colonoscopy is good is because if they see a polyp during the colonoscopy, the endoscopist can actually pluck off the polyp most of the time and get rid of it, therefore preventing it from turning into a cancer if that's what it's going to do in the future. Um, and also obtain pathology. So you know whether it's the type of polyp that puts you at risk for developing more polyps in your lifetime, or they also can identify cancers that way, obviously. And so it's a way to provide early detection and screening. Um, and so that's, that's, the, that's the most complete way of doing it. There are people who don't want to, you have to prep for colonoscopy, meaning you have to drink the nasty stuff and clean yourself out. You have to go to sleep for colonoscopy because it's uncomfortable. And so those are all things where if you either have a health condition or you live remotely or you can't tolerate the prep, you can't do that. Um, in lieu of that, there's something that's being used very commonly now in average risk population. So if you're at a higher risk, it's colonoscopy, that's it. So ColoGuard is um, a test where you actually just throw the little gizmo into the toilet and then fish it out and it turns color. And what it's looking for is DNA. And it actually turns out to be pretty effective in screening for abnormal DNA in stool. And um, so ColoGuard is, is a reasonable thing, but I, ColoGuard isn't gonna detect polyps and polyps are what are ca causing cancers. And if you have a polyp, you want it gone. So what's in between ColoGuard and, and endoscopy? And that's something called um, CT colonography or what's also known as virtual colonoscopy. And that is, it's pretty amazing, but you have to prep for it anyways. And it's where they are able to do 3D reconstructed imaging. And it's kind of like anybody who remembers Fantastic Voyage. It's kind of like, you know, flying through the colon and seeing all, all the walls and all the everything in three dimensions and being able to see irregularities. Well, obviously if there's a cancer there, or there's a mass there, you need to go on and have colonoscopy because they need to biopsy it and prove what it is. If there's polyps there, they'll see them, but they can't tell you whether they're 
precancerous polyps or not, plus they don't remove them. And I'm a, I'm a huge believer that removing a polyp before it comes becomes a cancer is how we can deal with colon cancer. Unfortunately, not everybody has access to that. But virtual colonoscopy is a reasonable screening alternative, but it's not a therapeutic alternative and it's not paid for by a lot of insurances. I think that Medicare is now paying for it. And I think that many insurances will pay for it if somebody has an incomplete colonoscopy. So if you've had abdominal surgery or bad diverticulitis and there's lots of adhesions, scar tissue, that kind of kinks the colon and makes it such that somebody who's tried to do a colonoscopy, they can't get around the corner, then I think you can have a completion evaluation with a virtual colonoscopy. Did I answer your question? Awesome. Yeah, that was perfect. I have three questions though. Sure. Um, so. So we, you were talking a little bit about genetic risk because they're not at average risk, right? So they, they're they not on a 10-year um, a cycle. Is, is their cycle less if you're at genetic risk, if you have a genetic risk, or does that just mean they need to screen earlier or more frequently? Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, if you are at higher risk, let's just say you are um, a you have no um, family cancer syndrome and you don't have any genetic mutation that puts you at higher risk, but you have had polyps. Once you've had pre polyps and all polyps are precancerous. So um, there are adenomatous polyps and those, um, if you left them alone for long enough, they might turn into cancer. There's hyperplastic polyps, which actually, um, are not associated with cancer, but they are markers for adenomatous polyps um, somewhere else in the colon. And then there's something called a villus adenoma, and that's the one that's at the highest, gives you the highest risk of developing cancer if you leave that alone. And that's basically size-based and the size is time-based. The longer it's there, the more it'll grow, the more it grows, the more likely it is to develop a cancer within it. So um, if you have a history of polyps, you will be on a less than 10 year cycle. Um, depending on the type of polyp, you may be on a five year cycle or a three year cycle. And depending on the number of polyps and whether somebody feels like, oh, well, there were like 15 polyps, a lot of times they'll bring you back the next year because they're concerned they missed some of the polyps because yeah. there were so many. So. Um, so there's a question about um, can they grow again after they're they're removed, which people you know it's hard to understand that. Like if I got rid of them, why why can't so it be done now? The ones that are like a mushroom, where the endoscopist will kind of put a snare around the stem and pop it off, and it goes away. Those don't regrow. The ones that are like a carpet, um, and they, they basically, there's nothing to snare around that. So they basically bite it and pull it off. And it doesn't hurt because the lining of the intestine doesn't have pain sensation. So they actually will pull that off. If they don't get the whole thing then, and you leave polyp cells or adenomatous cells around the edges, it'll grow back. So I, if somebody, if that person is, may have experience with somebody who had a villus adenoma where the, the person had piecemeal removal of the villus adenoma. And the longer, the longer that piece is there that you didn't get out, the more likely it will be to transition into, um, into a cancer. There's something, there, are, there, there is a specialty called interventional uh, GI and talk about not doing surgery anymore. We used to operate on patients and take out segments of their colon for this all the time. Um, there are some people who are extremely talented at being able to take out large villus adenomas using very special tools that they have. Not every GI person is, is talented at a, is successfully accomplishing a major polyp but um, there are some people who are really good at that and saves people a surgery. That's awesome. So um, another question, and we're kind of winding down here. So if you have more questions, you guys put them in there. Um, what are the easiest preps 
I heard there's some new, easier ones out there. Okay. So the prep that I give people um, when I do colon surgery, I prep patients is it's um, a small bottle of Miralax, which is a laxative. It's a tasteless, odorless, colorless powder. And it's the, not the Costco size, because that will make you miserable, even more miserable, but it's 234 grams. So it's the small bottle in two quarts of Gatorade. Pick your favorite flavor. The GI docs, when they're doing a colonoscopy, tell you not to drink anything red because they're not, I know that's like so crazy because they should be able to tell blood from red, yellow, but you know. Um, but when you're doing colon surgery, it doesn't matter what color you put it in. I tell people to put it over ice in a big mixing bowl. You drink a cup every 15 minutes. Um, and that's for colon surgery. And so, and then I also tell people to stop drinking when it's watery coming out because you're done. So you don't have to drink all two quarts of Gatorade. Um, there was something, there's something out there called Movi Prep, which is several pills like I, I never used it because uh, I don't know that it's that great, but it's like a set of like 16 pills that you have to take a couple of times. Plus you have to use magnesium citrate. And anyway, so there's Moby prep. There used to be something called fleet Swasta soda, but it's off the market now. And that was the easiest thing. It was like um, uh, a pint of drinking the Pacific ocean. So the reason why salt every, all of these are kind of saltier salt base is because what, when you have salt in the inside of the intestine, it makes water, it draws water in and kind of flushes everything out. So yeah, Mir Miralax is a great over-the-counter um, stool softener. Awesome. Um, one last question, and I think we just have a couple more minutes. Um, and, you know, I actually think this should probably be another um, health conversation with someone who, who deals with this a lot, but IBS, because it certainly is prevalent. I think there's a lot of people talking about it, different symptoms that people have. They think they have IBS. Um, so maybe the, you know, a, a quick um, recap of what it is and who you should see and what the most common symptoms are um, would be helpful. Absolutely. So we know a lot more about IBS now than we ever did before. Um, it used to be one of those things where it was in your head or whatever. IBS is um, where people, it's called irritable bowel syndrome. It is where people have either alternating, there's constipation predominant, diarrhea predominant, alternating between constipation and diarrhea, usually associated with abdominal pain. And so it, it was a, you know, it was a sort of a, cate it was a categorical diagnosis where when somebody was complaining about their bowel habits and they had abdominal pain, they had IBS and, you know, you had to take Metamucil, put them on fiber, make their bowel habits regular and go away. And so IBS for the gastroenterologist is sort of like itchy butts for me. You know, it's, it's something that, you know, you can't always figure it out. You can't always fix it. The deal now is they're learning a lot more about it and they're learning a lot more about the um, enteric, the intestinal neural pathways. And there are more focused treatments about IB for IBS. And there's a lot of medication on the market that's kind of targeted now, more towards the constipation, um, predominant irritable bowel syndrome that really can make a difference. So the person, you should see the gastroenterologist um, for that. And there are some people who have a, a huge area of interest, much more common in women than men. So there's gotta be some sort of a hormonal relationship a lot of people find that before their periods, they get constipated or things like that. And so um, there's there's more out there than it used there used to be. I think that's that's really helpful, and I'll, I will take that um, and find someone to do a future health conversation. So while I'm saying that, if you guys have other topics, um, Claudia that San Miguel, you want to, that excellent that you um, want to hear about, please put them up. But I just I'm super grateful um, to Dr. Childs for her time. I know it's it's a Thursday night and you rushed home from the hospital. Um, oh, no, it was incredible insight and it's uh, refreshing. I love how frank you are with, um, with the discussion because there are topics that we're embarrassed about and your point about right. like, if your doctor's not doing a proper exam, find someone else because you know, we are, we're like, no one really wants to ask for someone to, 
do a digital rectal exam, no. but um, you know, you, you have to talk about these things and there's no reason to live with things that are impacting your lifestyle. So your approach to this um, was incredible. I really appreciate it. Anytime. There's, there's so much to talk about and um, you can put my contact information up there. I mean, I'm happy, you know, I'm happy to answer questions or direct people um, to the, to the right provider specialist. Um, and, and I think that the biggest issue is, you know, don't put your head in the sand. I mean, if something is a problem, you know, you'll find the right person to take care of it. People ask me all the time, you know, I, if I act uncomfortable when I'm dealing with this and I dance around the issue and I can't speak in plain language, then you won't be comfortable. And so my goal is to just, you know, be your best friend when it comes to that. And just, you know, I have to say, just say what you're trying to say, you know, send me a, you know, send me, take a photo with your phone and send me a picture. So I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yes, we awesome? definitely, we definitely do that. So, um, I will post this on the um, Women's Health and Wellness Institute Facebook page. So if anybody wants to share it with friends, because I think that was incredible information here um, that a lot of people can benefit from, but really appreciate it, Dr. Child. No problem. Thank you. Be well, everybody. Get your vaccines. <laughs> Be well. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.